Oh, there you go. Okay, good afternoon. Asi, uh, it's not just me up here. I'll be joined by my colleague. He's actually our, um, our Microsoft technology officer. His name is uh, Dundee Mata. So, Dundee, can you join me up on stage? Thanks. All right. So, um, so thank you. First, it's an honor to be here. Uh, and thank you, Maria, for inviting me. Uh, so, uh, first things first, uh, Microsoft, I think people have heard of companies, and maybe you're not as familiar with what we've been doing more recently. Actually, what we want to do, we have to change this title to apology. It's actually TV white space and its role in disaster response. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about the Philippines, right? I think I didn't see the number of hands that actually went out, but uh, how many people here have smartphones? Right, so it, it's not just statistic, right? So they say that the number of devices, when you kind of look at uh, in the Philippine context, they're saying that number of average devices in the U.S. is 4.3 uh, devices per person. What they're saying is in the Philippines is 4.6, right? Uh, and then another interesting statistic is that 54% of people within Metro Manila have a smartphone. Now, that's interesting for people within Metro Manila. When we're talking about uh, things where we talk about disaster response, and we see that the, the best uh, the best device is still the 2G device that you what you charge once and you still have you know you have battery left for two to three days, right? So uh, one of the interesting things though is uh, when we kind of talk about mobile penetration, we're in the top 15, right? More than 100% mobile penetration. So I always joke, even the dead have cell phones in the Philippines, probably because of the dual SIM, right? Uh, but we're moving towards the we're moving towards an area. We're moving towards an area where the smartphone, which used to cost twenty-five thousand pesos, you'll see some announcements within the next six to nine months where you're seeing a lot of those smartphone devices, people that have access to the application, as, as was mentioned earlier, to be sub, yeah, sub three thousand pesos. Right. So you're going to see that landscape uh, change very quickly. Now, if we kind of go through, I think Maria mentioned it this morning that one of the things that um, you know we talk about all of these services. Uh, but there's always a topic about connectivity, right? That's connectivity, and I think uh, one 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 good uh, uh, you know one good uh, sort of uh, statement there is around oxygen. You know, the oxygen of that is uh, connectivity is around. Is, the broadband is the oxygen for for the digital economy. In, in the Philippines, I'd even put that a little bit further and say the basic connectivity would probably be the oxygen for our economy. Right. So uh, having said that. Uh, there's this technology called TV white space. So first question, how many people here have heard of TV white space? How many people here watch those horror films, you know, where the you know, where the lady's sitting across from the TV looking at the uh, the static on the TV? Right? So TV white space in a nutshell is essentially uh, the ability to be able to deliver data services and broadband services on those unused frequencies, right? Over TV. So if you can think about it. Uh, if, a, if a TV antenna can broadcast, let's say, for example, all the way to a TV set, right? Uh, that's maybe good for uh, 50 kilometers. TV white space would have a fairly shorter range because you need an up, uh, you need an upload speed, so maybe around uh, around uh, 10 kilometer range. Now, why would TV white space make sense? Well, how many people here have set up a, an access point in their house for Wi-Fi, right? So you put your Wi-Fi in your house, and all of a sudden you go through a couple of walls. When you're all the way on the other side, your internet doesn't work anymore, right? The advantage of TV white space is because of that broadcast technology, that frequency, it has the ability to go through foliage, through walls, through through barriers, right? So it does. When we say 10 kilometer radius, it will actually cover complete connectivity for 10 kilometers. Now there's a great story uh, with Microsoft, and the reason why I have Gandhi up here is because. We were working with the Department of USC, uh, Department of Science and Technology, on a pilot. And it just so happened, we were at the brink of, when we were doing this pilot, we were at the brink of the natural disaster, the disaster that Mother Nature has a funny way of saying hello nowadays, right? Uh, it, it, at the brink of the natural disasters that actually happened last year. So the guy that was, our, uh, that was on the ground that actually has more information and we can talk more through it, is actually going to be. So I'm going to turn it over to Johnny and talk a little bit more. Right. Yeah, thanks, Joanne. I got to click this. And, uh, let's just wait. Okay, when did the big one happen? Stop on wood. It doesn't, right? Yeah. The big one is the earthquake. And we're all expecting that. Well, is there anyone here from Bonifacio Line or Bonifacio Estate Services? So if you go and talk to them, they don't even say if it will happen, they say when it will happen. Right. And they, that's why you would be very lucky if it happens here because they have a hospital, it looks right there. So there will be hundreds of doctors and nurses available. And like the scientists, 
we can feed millions of people for one. But let's get serious, right? If, was, well, if an earthquake were to hit, what would we do? First thing is, duck, copper, and hold. Remember that, right? We're going to do duck, copper, and hold. And then after the ground starts taking, we then rush out. And we go to the evacuation centers identified from when it global city, which are Manila Gulf and Kansas and the American War Memorial. And we would expect to be there for days or even weeks. Because what will happen to the rest of Metro Manila? Obviously, power will be off because the lines will go down. The water may have to break because of all the station of the earth. The road network would be impossible. Forget about bridges. Which means that, you know, all those cars uh, on Elsa will probably stop there, be stuck there for several days because of the accident. You wouldn't be able to drive out and go home to Alabama or Kevin City or wherever you are. In other words, you'd be stuck here in Bonifacio Global City for a couple of days at least. So what would you want to do? Of course, you'd want to communicate and go to Rescue PH. You know, put your, your Twitter up and tell your family, hey, I'm safe, I made it through. By the way, I need my medicines tonight. And someone gets them to me, so on and so forth. As Maria was saying earlier, there's this bottom-up. But there's also the top-down, right? Where the government agencies want to be able to coordinate what's happening on the ground. And technology is the layer between the bottom-up and the top-down. And if you cut that technology layer, it becomes very difficult to move forward. Of course, there are some options. Right, you'd be able to get the word out maybe uh, using Wi-Fi, but Wi-Fi only travels 300, 500 meters. Right? And typically, after an earthquake, you know, those uh, Wi-Fi uh, routers will go down because the power is out. Of course, you'd try to go through your cellular phone, maybe 3G, 4G. And if some uh, cell sites are still up in an area not affected by the earthquake, maybe you'd be able to get through. Three kilometers away, maximum, with the cellular network. But more often than not, the best way to communicate is with your satellite phone. How many of you have satellite phones in the Philippines? If you don't have one, well, as you saw, with DSWD, what did they do in Tacloban? They had this thing on the back part, right? And they were able to put a, a very small access terminal to connect to a satellite in a matter of hours. In fact, uh, there are some satellite kits you know, that look like this. It's actually basically a balloon, so it's very easy to carry and set up and, and can be established within ice. The problem with something like this is if we were to have a VSAT terminal, people would then have to queue and line up, right? As, uh, as Noy, Director Noy of the AWD was saying in the video earlier, people were lining up for hours just to be able to go and use it for three minutes. And then the next one will come along in, in the next one. Plus, they had to walk to get to that USWD center. And after, in, in after Typhoon Yolanda had passed through Layton, a 15 minute walk began, two, three hours to cover uh, because the trees were down, both, so on and so forth. And so, what if we could get that satellite signal and throw it out five, seven, ten kilometers so that people would not have to travel? to where your communication satellite was set up so they could go to centers, evacuation centers, where they could access that signal. And that's precisely what we did in Palo Alto. Uh, and this was done with the coordination of the Department of Science and Technology. At the region eight center, they set up a VSAT for solar power. And the signal was then uh, brought into this building and they threw it out to point number two there, the second point, to a small antenna. Okay, that's the TV white space antenna. It doesn't have to be outdoors, it can be kept indoors. So uh, sometimes like security, someone might steal it, might get trained on, you know, that, that wasn't there. It went long distances, and because it's TV signal, it, it's not point to point, it's not line of sight. It's basically broadcast. So any TV white space antenna that was established within the pizza slide would actually access your backboard to the internet would actually access the, the satellite signal. And they could go on Twitter, Facebook, the email, and so on. Uh, this is where the satellite was set up. Uh, this picture here is the uh, administration uh, center of the Philippine Science High School. And that's how a lot of the faculty of the Science High School are actually able to start doing their lessons because they were getting ready for the opening of classes. Uh, and this is the Philippine Science High School dorm. 
The dormitory was used during the first few days as a staging center for bomberos and leaders. It's a group of uh, Spanish uh, humanitarian workers. And so, with every evening, when they would get back to the home base, they would be able to connect with other agencies and get folks back home. Another uh, establishment of the CDY Space Center was done in Tanawan later. Uh, this time, we didn't have a satellite signal. The smart tower was already up by the time we established the network, connecting to the outside, connecting to the, uh, this is actually the town hall and the English Central School. And how many of you are going to Lincoln two days from now? I encourage you to go and speak with the mayor of Tanawan because he can actually tell you all about how they have been using the city White Space Center. So, you know, I guess some of you have questions. And this, when I tell the story, these are frequently the questions that I get asked. So, since all the storytellers have decided to address this, so the three stories. The story of change. So how did the city white space technology come about? The story of serendipity. How did the Philippines, you know, instead of Indonesia or China or India, why was it that Philippines became the poster child for this technology? And a story of maybe a bit of a sci fi, because I'll make some predictions about the right thing. So, you know, I'll end with these three stories. And the first is the story of change. You know, how did TV white space come about? And just like with any drug, you have to undergo approval by the Food and Drug Administration. Technology goes through the same cycle. It's not like I think of something and then tomorrow it can be in the market and it's, it's working. Especially since people say disruptive technology impacts many players within the ecosystem, those processes have to be followed. So, process is so the story started back in 2007, seven years ago, when uh, scientists at Microsoft Research were given this challenge. The challenge was one, the entire U.S. television network industry moved from analog broadcasting to digital broadcasting. What can we do with those channels that are free now? That's called the digital division. And so we started writing papers about this in 2007, 2008. It was version one, version two, version three. Peer review, we presented the conferences, we would get best paper award, but always there would be some new improvement. Uh, because we started with frequency sensing, or frequency sending to geolocational database, so on and so forth. Until in 2009, we felt it was good enough, and we went to the FCC and said, hey, can we, you know, we've written about this, we've gotten peer reviews and criticisms, and we now actually try it out. And the FCC granted the first operational license to Microsoft to operate a white space network on its red one campus. And this is so, these shuttles are the shuttles that Microsoft employees used to ride around the Microsoft campus in that one. It's about 99 buildings or something like that. And while you're riding that vehicle, a TV white space signal is actually allowing the employees to work even while they're in the shuttle. Okay. So we earn our salary. This will work for you while we're So in the shuttle, there's a Wi Fi sticker, and, and so everyone on that shuttle. Yes, you can You can connect your phone, you can connect your laptop, and work even if it's taking 30 minutes an hour to get to the next building. So we proved that it works, and we then decided to get other industry players. And we formed an, a consortium called the Cambridge White Space Consortium to conduct trials on a large scale. And if you notice, the other members of the consortium include our media companies like uh, BBC. Right, Sky, uh, as well as some uh, equipment manufacturers like Samsung, of course, Nokia, which has uh, been partially acquired. So, this is a large scale, a large scale trial. And finally, finally, the industry said, okay, we're ready to start to release that. And so, in 2012, pilots were announced in Africa, in Asia, in the US, and Ofcom, the regulator in the UK, came up with some rules. And so we can, we can officially say this is when TV white space officially entered as a technology. In order to roll this out, uh, you know, demos were made at the Inter-American Development Bank annual meeting in Montevideo, Paraguay, as well as the annual Asian Development Bank meeting, which at that time, so it didn't be was held in Manila. And so that's how Manila entered the picture. 
Of course, in Manila, and, and so now I, I talk about the second story of okay, how this serendipity happened. Because in the Philippines, we actually have something in 2010 called the Philippine Digital Strategy, which has something called this a goal, Internet for All. Now, this isn't exactly the graphic, but I think you get the idea. <laughs> it's about our hierarchy. Okay, right, I added on there. But that's what one of the goals of the Philippine Digital Strategy is really, hey, everyone should have Wi-Fi, okay? And in 2011, the ICT office was created, and these two gentlemen, uh, under Secretary Katambre of the ICTO and the Secretary Mario Montero of the Department of Science and Technology, got fully behind this technology, and they said, you know, Microsoft has something to offer, we're willing to look at it, we're willing to use it to achieve internet connectivity, for everyone. In fact, I think Maria first saw the TV white space from Secretary Montejo, right? So she said, this is how we're going to reach the South Philippines. Of course, as I mentioned at uh, the ADB, I know demo, when I actually went in, I was doing some of the writing, and we did the demo. We showed it to the 47 countries of the ADB. Most importantly, uh, the OSP saw that. And everyone here likes this is going to be a disruptive technology. So, uh, there was some resistance from the regulator, from the broadcaster, from the telcos, and so on. And it took six months before we finally got a, a work done together to bring everyone to the table. And the U.S. AID Health Fund is in fact we have two visitors from the U.S. Federal Communications Commission who came and helped to facilitate this work done. So it's a long process, I'm right? telling you. You know, this new technology sometimes can take a while to land. And we're lucky, you know, because the Philippines is a few years ahead of our neighbors like Myanmar, Indonesia, Thailand, and so on, because we've, we've, we've been going through these baby steps already. And one of the things that was agreed on at the workshop was this let's do a pilot first in the Philippines. Right? Before we roll it out in Manila, in Quezon City, you know. The telcos, the broadcasters said, we want to see it working in an area. We want to observe the interference. You know, is it messing up our TV broadcast? You know, so on and so forth. And so the agreement was made to have a pilot on the island of Bohol. Uh, and this is where we have the signing of the MOU between the OSP and our, our general manager, Sally Ilagan. And it was agreed to do it in Bohol because the USAID have a project in Bohol called EcoSeed. Or eco uh, uh, ecological fishing and sustainable livelihood. Right? Taking hooks out of the water while at the same time providing jobs for the fishing community. And why is Bohol chosen? Because Bohol has one of the double barrier reefs. And there are only six in the whole world. Uh, New Caledonia has one, Australia has one, the Philippines has a double barrier reef. And the unique ecology of the double barrier reef allows for the development of species which later on could help us to know, maybe cure cancer, you know, maybe uh, cure a lot of new diseases. But it's important to preserve the biodiversity of the Mahon Reef, the name of the double body of reef. And so, USA said, okay, if you have this technology, you have to do a pilot, let's do it on the hall, and finally, in April of this year, we turned over the wall network to the people community. Benefiting over 20,000 beneficiaries, so the, the people folk and their families and their schools and so on. In fact, Joel put together this video, uh, you know, which shows really, you know, the Philippines is such a huge area that you want to cover, you know, with TV white space and internet connectivity. But he shows these uh, three locations in Bohol, uh, beginning with the Tubigon uh, area. Tubigon was actually one of those targets by the uh, by the earthquake. And, and the purple ones are, are it's elementary schools yeah. that actually covers a lot of uh, hospitals, government health units, so that whole area, uh, including the universities, were actually uh, you know, uh, internet connected. Right, so yeah. Yeah. the rural health units and also the LGU. Now, we put together this network plan in October of last year. In fact, Maria, we, we presented this on the CIO network uh, for, for Microsoft customers. Not knowing that a week after we were rolling this out and everyone was using it, exactly a week later the earthquake hit. And so we made a decision, you know, let's redeploy some of those radios to the towns and we started hard hit by the radios. Uh, hard hit, sorry, by the earthquake. 
And then barely a month later, of course, I told you that I told you that I And we also made the decision, let's take several more radios and redeploy them in Palo and in San Juan. And because of all these redeployments, it actually delayed our network turnover in the world. But finally, in April, we did have the network turnover. Okay, so that's why the Philippines is now the poster child of CDY State. We have the first ever deployment during a time of disaster, and we have one of the largest CDY State networks in the world. Okay, I think Africa is going to be deploying something that's a bit larger in a few months, but we will also overtake them because come January, we're going to do another deployment this time on the island of Luzon. So the last story I'll tell you is, you know, some, some kind of science fiction, maybe. 2013 happening now, what predi predictions can be made? I think the first prediction is that we're going to see more of these CD white space radios in the disaster response tool too. Why? Because it's very easy to deploy, right? You don't have to do any kind of alignment, you just basically put the antenna down, hang it up. It's working, it's long range, 10 kilometers. Uh, it's the you know, we've actually tried 12 kilometers in Bohol, and it still goes to 12 kilometers. And you can use it for peer to peer. Meaning, even if you don't have an internet connection, you can have the DPWH talking to the Department of Health, talking to the TNT, and so on. So it's a peer to peer network. And of course, once you have the internet connection, you can be brought down. We've made presentations of, of these lessons learned. The UN Emergency Telecommunications Cluster, that was a block in Bergen, eight days. We presented this to the ADB at their ICT for Development Conference held in Manila last May. And next month in San Jose, California, uh, the same presentation will be made to the IEEE Global Humanitarian Technology Conference. So we're getting the word out. We would like people to start putting to the white space radios in their disaster response toolkit. And the NDPs are, of course, the NGOs. Right? Of course, we'd also like cities and government agencies to do this. And so there are additional deploy deployments being planned. In fact, uh, as you speak, this area itself, one of the global cities, is trying their own to do white space network deployment. So when the big one comes, it's a big What else? What else can be predicted? And this is, of course, a bold prediction and licensed usage. Right? When you use Wi Fi now, do you have to pay anyone for that spectrum? No. When you use 3G, 4G, LTE, yes, right? You have to subscribe. And the price of your subscription is dependent on the franchise cost that the carrier pays for that license. And oftentimes it's the highest bidder. But Wi Fi was unlicensed, so you don't have to pay to use that spectrum. We are seeing countries like Singapore uh, already uh, beginning October 1, their regulations will take effect where TV white space is unlicensed. And you can use it like Wi Fi. We're looking at doing, doing something similar in the Philippines. Uh, Senator uh, Rexel is working on a bill at the Senate for the free Wi-Fi bill. Okay, we did the free Wi-Fi to four fifty six plus in the society and eventually make it wide. But as part of that, we have recommended that to make it affordable for carriers to do this, that they unlicense the use of the system. And last but not least, billions of devices. This is where all the big data will come from. Right, uh, Maria said, you know, real-time reporting, right, real-time response. All of you sending pictures in, tweets in, and so on. Eventually, again, this is a prediction, right, we're looking at the future. I think you will see TV white space antennas even in your phone and in your devices. And we will also see sensors uh, creating all of these machine-to-machine -machine interactions, also using the same spectrum. So can you imagine, right, if you have machine-to-machine -machine networks that have to pay an SMS fee every time you send, you wouldn't be sending a lot of machine data. Right? And if you have to rely on Wi-Fi for end-to-end networks, you'd have to build so many repeaters and so many access points. Right? But by using something like TV white space, I think that's how we reach the future of an internet of things, taking all that big data. So I'll end there, but thank you for your attention, and of course, we're here for questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Can we ask Jackie to join in the future?